I'm Steve Mann and this is Paper Classroom. Welcome to another Water and Chemical Additives tutorial. In this particular tutorial we're going to be talking about fillers or as some people call them opacifiers. So I suppose the first question is why do we add fillers? Well there's quite a few reasons really. We use it to increase the smoothness of the sheet with just the fibre there you've got lots of these hills and valleys and the fillers fill in those valleys to give you a, a great improvement in uh, sheet smoothness. We use it to increase the density of the sheet, get rid of all those air spaces. And of course we use it to increase the opacity of the sheet. Most fillers have got quite a high refractive index and that will uh, help to improve opacity, which means you're more likely to be able to print on both sides of the sheet without it showing through. We add fillers to increase the brightness of the sheet because generally all fillers are actually brighter than fibres. So any addition of filler to the sheet just makes it brighter and brighter. And we use it to reduce porosity. Sometimes if sheets are moved around in printing operations, vacuums needed. And if the paper is too porous, you can't get a good vacuum, so you can't get a good grip, so you can't move it around easily. So it reduces porosity. And as I say there, often, but not always, it's used to reduce cost. Later on, I'll show you a, a table of relative costs of different filler particles. So another thing you need to know for the exam is what are the ideal filler properties? If you were to design a filler, what would you want it to be able to do? Well, you want it to have high brightness so that you can make a sheet with high brightness. You want it to have a high refractive index because the more scattering power it has, the more opaque it will make your sheet, the less of it you'll need to use. You want to have small particle size. The smaller the particle size, ultimately the smoother the sheet's going to be. And large particles tend to fall out of the sheet and cause dusting much more than small particles do. You want low solubility which is obvious really, you don't want to throw a load of so-called filler into the wet end of your machine and it all dissolves. So ideally you want low solubility. Not all things have got very low solubility. Something like clay or titanium dioxide or chalk have relatively or fairly low solubilities, very low solubilities. But something like calcium sulphate, it's rare that that's used but it is, but it is actually quite soluble. And you want it to be inert. So here's a quick question for you all. I'll ask you the question then pause the video and have a little think about it. Which filler, common filler, is not inert? Okay I'll count down the answer. Four, three, two, one. Well it's calcium carbonate. Clays are fairly inert. Uh, mag uh, talc is fairly inert, titanium dioxide is fairly inert, but calcium carbonate, it's a carbonate, it will react with anything acidic. And you want it to be low cost. And that's, uh, that's one of the reasons we use filler. A typical filler may be around, say, £100 a tonne. Fibre may be £500 a tonne or more. So if you replace one tonne of fibre with one tonne of filler, you've immediately saved yourself £400. And you want it to have low density. If the density is low, that means the grammage of the sheet will be less and that's uh, cheaper to transport. And one of the trends, one of the global trends everywhere in almost every product is to make it smaller and lighter. 
Sorry about that, but we'll carry on. And finally, we want it to have high retention. When you put it in the wet end, when it's going into the sheet, you want it to stay in the sheet and not pass through the sheet and out into the white water system. So high retention is always good. Now this is the relative costs that I was telling you about. So a filler carbonate, what we mean by a filler carbonate is calcium carbonate that goes into the sheet, into the base sheet. And at the moment in the UK, it's around about £75 a ton. So you could uh, work out the cost of these should you wish. But we'll call that just one. So filler carbonate, one unit per ton. Happens to be 75. Clay that goes into the base sheet is more expensive. It's 1.3 times more expensive. And clay is less bright than carbonate. So you can see why people prefer calcium carbonate. And going back to the history module, if you remember, one of the sizing systems used to be rosin alum. And the acidity of the alum prevented people using calcium carbonate because carbonate and acid, very frothy paper, carbon dioxide given off. So you can see why they wanted to move from filler to carbonate. It's a brighter, or carbonate is a brighter product and it's cheaper. Now, we also put calcium carbonate in pigmented coatings. On the surface of the sheet, you might have one, two or three layers of coating. And coating carbonates are more pure and they're also finer, therefore they're more expensive. So a coating carbonate, 2.3 times the cost of a filler carbonate. And a coating clay, 2.7 times the cost of a filler carbonate. So again, the clay is more expensive than the carbonate. Talc is really a specialist product. It's a magnesium silicate and it's a very strange product talc because it has both hydrophobic and hydrophilic qualities. So it can be both water loving and water hating depending on the conditions. And it's most often used for papers that are going to go to the gravure printing process because the gravure printing inks are oil-based inks, so hydrophobic. PCC is precipitated calcium carbonate, so a man-made calcium carbonate. Calcine clay, I'll talk about, I'll talk about calcine clays a little later on, just it'll be easier when you see the picture to explain the difference between a regular clay and a calcine clay. Calcine clays, obviously you've done something to clay, so it's going to be more expensive than clay. 5.3 times the cost of a filler carbonate. And finally, TiO2. It is by far the best filler or pigment you could use. It's got the, it's head and shoulders above the others in terms of refractive index. It's got fantastic opacifying power, but it's, as you see, that's not a, it's not a mistake. I haven't missed out the decimal point. It's 53 times more expensive than filler carbonate. At the time of making this, it's approximately 4,000 pounds a ton. Whereas the filler carbonate is 75 pounds a ton. So TiO2, because of its expense, is always used sparingly for specialist uh, uses. It's used in currency paper, for example. And again, we'll talk about TiO2 later on in this module. Okay, so here's clay. Clay, some people also call it kaolin. It's an aluminium silicate, whereas talc is a magnesium silicate. Clay is an aluminium silicate. It typically exists 
not as individual hexagonal platelets like that, but stacked almost like a stack of pancakes. <clears throat> so it exists as stacks of hexagonal platelets. And as you can see, the interesting thing is the surface of the platelet has a negative charge and the edge of the platelets have a positive charge. Now, if you take that clay and you put it through uh, a calcination process, so a kiln at high temperatures, those clay platelets fall apart and then they fuse together, as you can see here. The fuse, fuse edge to face. And that causes huge rheological problems. If you could imagine stirring this, then the particles, because of the shape, they want to lock into each other. And sure enough, the faster you stir a calcined clay slurry, the thicker it goes. If you stir it fast enough, it will set like concrete. And then when you leave it alone, it'll come back to being a slurry again. So there's uh, tremendous difficulties in handling calcined clay slurries. <clears throat> Calcium carbonate or chalk, uh, there are two forms. There's a natural product that I'm going to talk about now, and there's also a man made material that we'll talk about after this slide. You dig it up from the ground from sedimentary rocks, uh, it can be in the form of limestone. Marble is just highly compressed chalk. So the chalk layer was formed, it was compressed under huge pressures high temperatures for millions of years and you end up with marble. There's also dolomite which is a mixture of calcium and magnesium carbonates and if you look at it, if you look they're almost round structures it's like a little collection of it's a round ball made up of lots of little round balls very roughly and if you sort of go down to the molecular level, you find there are actually two different uh, crystal structures for calcium carbonate. One is called the calcite structure and the other is called the aragonite structure. And this is important, which one of these you choose is important in things like uh, cigarette paper, for example. It affects the way that the cigarette paper burns. The other type of calcium carbonate is synthetic, it's man-made calcium carbonate. Very often large paper mills with huge energy uses and huge energy consumptions have a, a big stack out of which goes all the flue gases. And in those flue gases are quite high levels of, calcium, of uh, carbon dioxide, sorry. If you take that carbon dioxide and you bubble it through lime water, then you get a chemical reaction between the calcium hydroxide and the carbon dioxide and you get formed calcium carbonate. So it's a really great way for what you call carbon capture and storage. It stops carbon dioxide being released into the air. We turn it instead into calcium carbonate and that's good enough to use as a filler calcium carbonate in the sheet. <clears throat> if you look at these things, if you look particularly here, these man-made calcium carbonates have a needle-like structure. They too are brighter and uh, maybe cheaper than some of the clays. Uh, and they also have calcite and aragonite structures. It depends on the temperature and the precipitation conditions. You can swing it to more calcite or more aragonite. <clears throat> Titanium dioxide, another one that has two different crystal structures. You can see here the red represents the, ox the um, titanium, I think the white represents the oxygen and there are two different ways in which these 
molecules can, or these atoms can organize themselves around each other to form repeating crystal units. One of them we call the anatase form and the other we call the rutile form. So as you can see, for the same number of atoms, you've actually got a different shape and you've got a different volume. That means things like the refractive index will be slightly different, uh, the way in which it reacts with ultraviolet light will be different, the density will be slightly different, uh, so refractive index. Um, as you saw in that table, these things are very high cost, currently 53 times more expensive than a filler calcium carbonate. They also interact with ultraviolet light. Many years ago, when uh, motor cars came out that were the first white ones, after a short time, this beautiful white car went off and became yellow. And that's because when ultraviolet light hits a TiO2 particle, some of it is absorbed and then it's re-emitted and there's a bit of energy left over. And that energy affected the colour of the lacquer that was holding those TiO2 particles in the paintwork of the car. And that release of energy added double bonds to the lacquer. And those double bonds eventually got enough to, became, to become conjugated double bonds. And then you got this yellow colour. So the one thing you should never do is have TiO2 around where you have optical brightening agents because they're both extremely expensive and they both go for the, uh, they compete for the ultraviolet light and the TiO2 usually wins. So never use TiO2 where you have optical brightening agents. I mentioned talc. So talc is a hydrated magnesium silicate. So you can see there you've got layers of magnesium with layers, it's sandwiched between layers of silica. And the strange thing about these surfaces is they can be either hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Because of the hydrophobic nature, we often use them for stickies control because they adhere very strongly to the outside of the sticky, therefore pacifying it and making it non-sticky. And of course, gravure printing relies on oil-based inks. So the oil-based ink just loves to have this hydrophobic surface of the talc. And just to finish off, this is a, a summary of the fillers. So I've put down here china clay or kaolin, precipitated calcium carbonates, the ground calcium carbonates, the two forms of TiO2 and talc. And if you look at the refractive index, the light scattering power, look at that, look at TiO2, 2.55 and 2.7, way above everything else. The nearest that you've got there is 1.65 from precipitated calcium carbonate. They're all relatively good brightnesses apart from clay, clay's in the 80s, everything else is in the 90s. Um, and that's all I want to say about that really. You don't need that for the exam, that's just so you can get a, a feel for things. Well, I certainly hope you've enjoyed this uh, session on fillers. Thank you for watching, I hope you found it interesting and I look forward to seeing you in another one of my videos. Bye for now.